Hometown History is brought to you by Ritual. If you're like me, you believe that we deserve to know what we're putting in our bodies and why, especially when it comes to something we take every day. I've been overwhelmed before, trying to find a multivitamin I felt like I could trust. That's why I use Ritual. Their clean, vegan-friendly multivitamin is formulated with high-quality nutrients and bioavailable forms your body can actually use. What you won't find? Sugars, GMOs, major allergens, synthetic fillers, and artificial colorants. Plus, the delayed release capsule design makes taking your vitamins easy. I personally swear by Ritual. I found them over a year ago, and I take them daily. One of my favorite details about them is they have a fresh mint taste. I'm sure you know how some have that fishy flavor, or some just taste like chalk. Well, Ritual is different, and I trust what I am putting in my body is only doing good. Ritual is the multivitamin reimagined. A multivitamin should contain key nutrients and forms your body can actually use to help fill in gaps in the diet. No shady extras. Ritual's delayed release capsule design delivers high quality nutrients including vitamin D3 in just two daily pills. Get key nutrients without the BS. Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash hometown to start your ritual today. Long before there was ever a wolf of Wall Street, there was a witch of Wall Street though that title was hardly earned. Her name was Hetty Green, and she did her business on Wall Street in the second half of the 19th century and the very first part of the 20th, until she died in 1916. As far as finance goes, she was a heavyweight among heavyweights, to the point where she personally bailed out the entire city of New York multiple times when it ran out of money. She was stingy and a bit strange, but her greatest crime may have been simply to dominate a so-called man's world as a woman. In the words of one of her biographers, Charles Slack, who is here with us today. Her principal crime, so to speak, was that she lived life on her own terms in an age when women were supposed to behave in an entirely different way. Charles's book is called Hetty the genius and madness of America's first female tycoon. I ran into this book a few months ago, and I enjoyed it so much that I asked him to join us here. Thanks for being here, Charlie. Why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. My name is Charlie Slack. I live in Connecticut. I'm a writer, and I I became interested in Hetty Green, actually through my mother. I had published a a book recently, and I was sort of looking for my next subject, and my mother told me she had a, a book idea for me, and I sort of gave her that, can't wait to hear it, mom, look, and she told me about this woman named Hetty Green, who had, according to family legend, given one of our ancestors a silver tray and porridge dish, and she said this woman was fascinating. She was known as a as a miser and and was an incredible woman. So I I started poking around and I think it, to the extent I had ever heard of Hetty Green it was through the Guinness Book of World's Records where she was described as a almost in cartoonish way as the world's greatest miser and a woman so mean she ate cold oatmeal off of radiators and so forth and this sort of cartoonishly awful presentation of her But the more I started looking into her, the more fascinating she became to me. And that told me that maybe she was somebody who would be worth writing a book about. So it sort of confirmed my assessment that you should always listen to your mother. What can you tell us about Hetty's background? So Hetty Green was born in 1834 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And New Bedford is a fascinating place. Uh, Back in Hetty's day, it was one of the wealthiest towns in the United States, and it was the center of the whaling industry. 
and the Quaker whaling company owners had become fabulously wealthy. And of course, whale oil at that time, that was the fossil fuels of that age. And, and the uh, whales were used in industry and in perfume and just about everything. They really sort of the country, in a sense, ran on whale oil. And Hetty was born into a prosperous whaling family. Her father was a man named Edward Mott Robinson, who married into the family. The family name was Howland, and the Howlands of New Bedford were were leaders in the industry. And did she have an education and everything coming up from a wealthy family? She did. It's very interesting because uh, there were, as Herman Melville, who shipped out of New Bedford on the voyage that became the basis for Moby Dick, he noted that there were two New Bedfords. There was the elite, effete, wealthy New Bedford on the hill with the beautiful homes and gardens and parks. And then down at the waterside, there was the earthy uh, trading in the New Bedford that smelled of rotten whale oil and money and trade. And Hetty, from the start, as she could well have been part of that effete elite up on the hill, New Bedford, but her favorite place to be was down at the counting house of the Howland Whaling Company with her father and grandfather. She just loved business right from the start. So she did have sort of a formal education in the traditional sense, but she also had this drive to understand business, which was very rare for the for her time. You know, of course, the women were thought to not have a place in finance, and Hetty proved Uh, just about all of them wrong, which is uh, what I found to be one of the most fascinating things about her. So did she take over her family's company? What happened was she wound up inheriting when her father died, she inherited some wealth. By the time he died, the whaling industry was really sort of uh, going down. And she inherited quite a lot of money from her father. And in accordance with the traditions of the time, she received some of it that she had control over it, but the majority of it was bound up in trust that was uh, in control of some men who uh, had nowhere near her financial acumen. So one of the great battles of her life was with these men to try to gain control over her financial fortune. And she, she ultimately did that. She also had a terrific battle uh, for control of the estate of her aunt Sylvia, her spinster aunt Sylvia, who died and left a lot of money. And, and so Hetty battled, uh, she felt that she should control that. In some ways, as I say, Hetty was fighting against the times when women were considered not to have a place in finance. And I think also she had had, she was an only child, but she had had an, a brother who died in infancy. And I think that was a great disappointment to her father. And I think that in some ways I see Hetty's lifelong obsessive, maniacal quest to preserve and grow a fortune as, in a sense, an attempt to prove to her father and to herself that she could handle money and finance as well as any man. What ended up bringing her to New York? Well, she wound up uh, in New York. I mean, the family had had connections with New York, but she married a man named Edward Green, who was a financial figure from uh, Bellows Falls, Vermont, who had a lot of financial dealings. In 1885, Edward had used some of Hetty's money, unbeknownst to her and uh, in some of his investments and used it as collateral and had put uh, some of that money at risk. And so in 1885, when Hetty was middle-aged, she stormed down to New York and said it, it to wrest control of that money. And from then on, spent much of her life in and around New York City and became this uh, figure that became known as the Witch of Wall Street uh, because she uh, was buying and selling and trading. And she, she uh, in, in Manhattan, she lived in Brooklyn, she lived in Hoboken, New Jersey. She tended to live in inexpensive apartment buildings. She didn't want to spend the money, even though she owned big swaths of properties on Fifth Avenue. She didn't want to spend money on her own living quarters. And also, she didn't want tax collectors to ever be able to pin her down 
too precisely as to where she lived. What are some stories that would portray to our listeners just the idea or how out there she was with trying to make sure that she saved as much money as she could? Well, it's interesting. That's a great question. And in in every place where she lived, there were stories about uh, her miserliness. And, you know, uh, it, it is true. She had some deeply unattractive qualities when it came to money and miserliness. I always felt that that caused her financial genius to be overlooked in a way that I don't think if she'd been a man, that would have happened. I think that that men tended to get, and maybe still to this day, uh, sort of assessed first based on what kind of a financial genius they were, and then secondarily, what kind of a quirky personality they had. And for Hetty, it was always the other way around. It's what kind of a lady was she? Why wasn't she wearing fancy dresses? What, why was she wearing these old rags? So in each city where she lived, there developed a cottage industry of stories about her. And for example, in Bellows Falls, Vermont, there was a story of her turning everything upside down in a frantic search uh, over hours and hours and hours for a two-cent postage stamp. They told stories of her buying day-old bread and, and haggling with the uh, cleaners to only clean the bottom half of her dress because that's the only part that touched the uh, came in contact with the ground. In Hoboken, she had a furious fight with the city of Hoboken over a two dollar dog license for her beloved dog Dewey. And um, so there were these kind of stories on and on and on that built that built up. Some of them, I'm sure, were true. Some of them apocryphal. Uh, but she also showed kindnesses. She would uh, give piggy banks to neighbor children and put a dollar in it and give them more money as they saved. There were stories of philanthropy that are very hard to pin down. She never wanted to be known for philanthropy. I think she was worried that she would be besieged. But there were some sort of compelling leads that she gave money She would stay up nursing sick neighbors. So she was not sort of this hard-hearted, horrible, you know, 100% horrible person as she was sometimes portrayed. I think the most famous miser story uh, involved her son, Ned, who was uh, injured as a child in a sledding accident and badly wrenched his his knee and... uh, as he walked on it over time, he, it, he, he uh, developed a really bad leg. And ultimately, as a young man, he was a very large young man and, uh, and the leg had to be amputated and he wore a prosthetic leg for the rest of his life. And had he, one of the stories, probably the most unattractive story about her was uh, that she went to clinics that were meant for the poor and she would take her son to get free care. And it's a terrible thing to do. She, she mistrusted lawyers and she mistrusted doctors and thought that everybody was trying to rip her off. Over the years, that story kind of morphed into she didn't care about her son and she stood by while his leg was cut off because she was too cheap. And that wasn't true. She loved her son Um, She tried any number of home remedies and doctors over the years, but there was a very unattractive component to that story. And for Hetty, it kind of seems like she not only didn't trust some doctors and, and people like that, but there were also stories I saw of she thought people were following her. Was that accurate? Well, I think that that it it was accurate and also to a certain extent true. I mean, she she developed she was in her time one of, if not the most famous woman in America. She was written about endlessly in in the newspapers. And, you know, she at one point carried a gun with her when she walked around New York. And she was, so I, I do think that she was certainly had a degree of paranoia about her. And maybe sometimes it was, uh, it was warranted. There were some great stories of her, though, In many ways, she was fearless, and uh, there was one story of of her going to visit one of the banks she frequented, and she showed up, and she had, and the head of the bank said, Hetty, why don't you, uh, 
you know, take private carriages when you come to visit us. And she said, well, maybe you can afford a carriage. I can't. And she'd taken public transportation, but in her bag were several hundred thousand dollars worth of bonds. There were also another story I saw where she would just do her banking on the floor of the bank. Was that true? Well, she did. She had a, the bank where she did much of her banking and she sort of became a fixture there. She had, you know, use of the offices. And this was where the story developed that she, uh, one of the apocryphal heady stories was that she ate cold oatmeal for lunch. And actually, as it turns out, she would uh, heat the oatmeal on the radiators at this bank that she used for an office. And, and she would um, so she was a real fixture in the financial center uh, of, of New York. And the bank was just okay with her doing that? Well, she was such a large uh, depositor that uh, she could pretty much uh, do as she pleased. How much wealth did she end up coming up with? She died with about $100 million in wealth. And that, as according to the calculations, when I wrote the book, it's been a while since I wrote the book, but I figured that that was in the neighborhood of $2 billion. Now, there's no question but that she inherited a fair amount of money, but she really had a skill for, uh, for boosting that uh, fortune. I just ordered your book yesterday, and it's not come in yet, but I saw on your website where you mentioned a meeting that uh, JP Morgan put together. Can you tell me about that? Yes, in 1907, there was uh, the Knickerbocker crisis where, you know, there was a, a run on the bank and, and it was a financial panic. And J.P. Morgan in his uh, library in Manhattan organized meetings of some of the most influential financial people, financial men mostly, uh, in the United States and they got together to try to figure out a way to stabilize the financial system. There were a couple of prominent trusts that were uh, teetering on the edge of insolvency. And so through these um, intensive meetings, they sort of came up with some of the controls that eventually evolved into what is now known as the, the Federal Reserve System. And there was uh, one woman, as the newspapers reported, one woman who came in with a black dress and a black veil, so reporters weren't able to positively identify who that was, but they were pretty certain that it was Hetty Green, and that would make sense because she was really the only woman of her time that had the kind of financial might and the financial acumen to go head-to-head with the people in that room. So that was a, a pretty important moment in American financial history, and by all appearances, uh, Hetty was at the center of it. What was the most important thing you learned personally from Hetty and her life as the first American female tycoon? Well, I think, as I said, the most important thing to me was her financial genius and the power that she had. I mean, she, on several occasions, bailed out New York City when it didn't have the money to operate, if you can believe that. Hetty would uh, loan money and at a reasonable interest rate to help keep the city going. And so she had a wealth on a scale that was extraordinary. And she was not a speculator. I think a lot of the things that she talked about are great financial lessons. You can learn a lot from reading about Hetty Green, about handling your own finances, because she never speculated. She invested, and when a panic occurred and other people were losing their hats, she was always there with cash on hand and ready to lend and make money and acquire property, and she built a vast fortune that way. She followed, to a T, the most basic but hardest to follow advice in finance, which is to buy low, sell high, and uh, never panic during a panic. And ultimately, by the end of her life, she had gained a level of respect. There are some stories that I talk about in the book where she went head to head with some of the toughest financiers of her day and really came out on top more often than not. And for that reason, I think she set an example and she uh, was the first woman of Wall Street 
to do this. And so I think she's been unjustly neglected on that score. She's been, to the, as I say, to the extent she's remembered, it's as this miser and this character and on and on. But I think that um, she's never quite gotten the due she deserves as a financial genius. Whatever happened to her wealth? She left it to her son and her daughter in equal proportion. Both of them had married late in life. I think one of the things that Hetty feared most was that her kids would get married and that there would be interlopers and that the family fortune would sort of disappear off into other people's hands. And both of her children married late in life. Neither one of them had kids. When the son died first, the money went to the daughter, Sylvia. She died in around 1950 and gave the money away to a huge number of recipients, um, prominent colleges, the library in New Bedford, long lost relatives received some. So it sort of got scattered in that way. And um, that's what became of her fortune. Hetty had a reputation for being a hard woman. And in many ways, it sounds like she earned that. Do you think the chauvinism of that time contributed to her rough exterior? Would a softer woman have been able to thrive as she did? You know, that's a really wonderful question. I think you put your finger on something that I talk about in the book, which is that to a certain extent, her behavior, her demeanor, her dress was a shield of armor. If she had sort of dressed as a woman of the time was supposed to and spent time on her social life and things, I don't think that she would have been taken as seriously. And I think that in a way, her hard-nosed attitude and, and her personal characteristics, I think she knew that she needed to be tough as nails and she really rose to that need. Is that a lesson she learned the hard way? Are there stories of her getting burned as a younger woman by being too warm or trusting? Well, I think that she felt very burned in a very public battle over her Aunt Sylvia's fortune after her Aunt Sylvia died in New Bedford and left money and there were there was sort of a colossal fight over the fortune. Hetty tried to prove that Sylvia had intended to leave all the money to her because she wanted to control it. And she lost that battle. She got some money, but nowhere near as much as she thought she should get. And that was sort of one of the great humiliations of her life. Incidentally, on a social scene, when she wanted to, she was from the wealthy family in New Bedford, and she could, and on occasion did, join social circles and knew exactly how to do it. One time when she was a young woman, she was a beautiful young woman, and she was visiting New York, spending a, a month or more with in, in New York and went to a ball and danced with the Prince of Wales. And there were all of these stories. And later when her daughter married much later in life, Hetty took a suite of rooms at a fancy hotel and went and did, got herself made up and dressed to the hilt and so forth. So she knew how to engage socially. But back to your earlier question, I think that she felt most comfortable presenting herself as this hard-nosed, scary woman, because I think that's what she felt gave her the best business advantage. So she probably embraced this caricature of the witch of Wall Street. At least this meant that people were taking her seriously. She undoubtedly preferred her other nickname, the Queen of Wall Street, but that doesn't have the same ring to it. What are some misconceptions about Hetty that we might clear up? I think most of us come to her with this very two-dimensional idea of basically a female Scrooge. But you've described things like giving piggy banks to kids that suggest that she was a warmer person than we might assume. Well, I would say I, I want to be careful to not overstate that. I just think that it's been so overstated the other side. But let me emphasize that there were unattractive things that she did. And certainly the miser, and she could be very, very tough in business and, and, and as I say, haggling over a $2 dog license and, and things. So she definitely had that side to her, but there was this sort of other side to her that was attractive that I think got hidden and sometimes she deliberately hid. And I think that would be sort of the main misconception about her. And, and another thing is that she didn't, you know, as I said, there were sort of stories that she gave money, but she 
disavowed those and the you know there, there was a lot of misbehavior during that gilded age and the robber barons and and so forth and and in a lot of cases people from that era rehabilitated their image by building universities and libraries and and you can see their names on buildings all across the country to this day in starting foundations and Hetty never did that she wanted to hand her fortune off to her kids the only building that I know of that bears her name is the administration hall at Wellesley College in Massachusetts, and that was done by her son. And I think Hetty would have resisted that. <laughs> she would have maybe rolled over in her grave. But to that extent, she did her own posterity a disservice because she didn't leave behind these libraries and foundations of people who could set about busily rehabbing her image. That's really too bad because it sounds like almost all of her money ended up going to charities anyway. She didn't get the positive press of Carnegie or Rockefeller, but really wasn't so different from those guys. Her belief was in, you know, I think you could see it in that giving the piggy banks to the kids and encouraging them to save. Now, rightly or wrongly, and you can argue this to the hilt about, you know, there's a love philanthropy and But her belief was in what she considered to be fair business. So she would loan money to New York at a prevailing but not extortionate interest rate. She loaned money to many churches at low interest rates when they needed money for improvements. Municipalities, I, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, it was Tucson, Arizona, built its sewer system based on a bond issue that Eddie bought. So, But that's what she believed her capital could be used for, and and that's what she believed in. My first instinct with a lot of the miserly antidotes you were sharing was that most of them were apocryphal. But it sounds like, for all of the good that she did, most of those stories are true. The haggling over a $2 dog license and that sort of thing. I don't know about the oatmeal off of a radiator thing. That sounds just a bit too colorful to be true, but it seems like we can get lost on either side of Hetty's story. We can demonize her like the media did when she was alive, or we can redeem her to the point of basically leaving the real woman behind. Exactly. And she, no, there's no question that she uh, was hard-nosed and she saw her life as a nonstop battle against people who were trying to take her money, who thought she couldn't do things. And she had a furious battle with Collis Huntington, the railroad magnet, and she feud that went on for years and years and years. And she said at one point, I'll outlive them all. That's kind of the way she looked at life. But, I, but you mentioned misconceptions. And one of the, here's one that one of the primary misconceptions about her was that she was a miserable woman in terms of her own feelings, her own outlook on life, that she was unhappy. And to me, that was one of the most prevailing images of her, but it was really a projection from other people because they were thinking, if I had millions and millions and millions of dollars, I would not be living in a cheap apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey. You know, I'd be over there in Fifth Avenue. I'd be traveling the world. I'd be, so everybody sort of thinks that way. And rightly or wrongly, I would be much more, uh, you know, tending towards that as well in myself, I think. But her lifestyle made her happy, I believe. I think she was a pretty happy person. I think people misconstrue because they wouldn't have lived that way, that she must have been miserable living that way. And I think that uh, really what she did, her principal crime, so to speak, was that she lived life on her own terms in an age when women were supposed to behave in an entirely different way. You mentioned that we might learn from the way Hetty invested. What else can we learn from her life? Certainly her degree of financial success often comes at great personal sacrifice. People with that kind of wealth often accumulate it at the expense of personal relationships. What can we learn from both the good and the bad of Hetty's life? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. You know, I wrote a previous book about the inventor Charles Goodyear. And it was called Noble Obsession. And he went on this lifelong quest to find a way to vulcanize rubber, to make it impervious to heat or cold. And it wound up changing the world. But along the way, his kids were starving. His life was falling apart. 
And he had this maniacal obsession with solving this scientific problem. And I find the two characters, Charles Goodyear and Hetty, sort of similar in that sense that she was absolutely obsessive and maniacal about saving money, earning money, growing money. For her, I do believe, I don't, I'm not a psychologist, but I do believe that her life was lived in a, the, the quest to prove to her father that she could grow the wealth better than any man. But I think as with all obsessives, it had its sort of, it had definitely this cost, this tremendous cost and a negative effect on her family and in a way on her life. So I think there are, as with any person who's obsessive like that, there are things to admire and then sort of cautionary aspects. Thank you again, Charlie. It's been a pleasure. If you want to know more about Hetty Green, you can find Charlie's book, Hetty, The Genius and Madness of America's First Female Tycoon, on his personal website or on Amazon.com. Charlie's website is charlesslackauthor.com. 